Well, thank you so much for having me, um, everyone. I'm a 2005 graduate from NC State in the Ag and Extension Education Program. Uh, so I feel like I know what you guys do and I understand all of the uh, challenges to your job. And a lot of you have helped me out in uh, my time at NC State as well as my time here at the Department of Agriculture. So thank you for those of you that I know and those that I have spoken to. And hopefully I make a few new friends today and you can help me out and I can help you out. So the first thing I want to talk about this morning is um, early detection and rapid response. This is a concept that I'd like to cover at the very beginning to kind of tell you why I'm here in front of you, um, even virtually in front of you. Um, and that's because you guys are out there with boots on the ground seeing things every day that I don't get to see. You know, we have people here represented from you know, almost every county in the state, and you have people in your counties bringing you plants uh, every day that you get to see. So I want you to understand that we want to find bad things. It could be bad plants, bad diseases, bad bugs. We want to find bad things when they are in the green area of this slide. Um, so early on, right after introduction, we want to find things when, where that arrow says detection. Um, because that's early on in time, which is on the bottom axis, as well as area infested. If we wait until that pest has reached uh, populations that are up in the orange or the red, it's going to be very expensive to control that pest and it's going to be widely distributed. So it's really going to be impossible to get rid of that pest once it's here. So the whole point of this slide is let's find these bad things early and let's try to get rid of them early on because it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do that. If we wait until they're up there at the top of the curve, um, we've already lost the battle. And also I am happy to answer questions at any time during this, um, during this presentation. And Charlotte will help me know if you guys have a question. All right, so our job, my job here at NCDA, your job in Cooperative Extension is to prevent the sale and establishment of bad things. So today I'm mostly gonna talk about bad plants. And I wanna give you a couple of examples of plants that have come in through the horticulture industry as contaminants. So um, on one side of the slide, you'll see that we found some tropical spiderwort one year in Liriope, uh, a horticultural plant. We also um, famously, found giant salvinia all over in the coastal plain about 10 years ago, and it was a contaminant in the water garden industry. So when people went to get a scoop of their favorite water lily, they got a side of giant salvinia. And then uh, oftentimes we find hydrilla as a contaminant in these um, tanks with other aquatic plants. And we also found myelaminate vine here um, coming into the state growing in potted hosta plants. So that's one of the major um, ways that pests come into our state is through contamination in the horticultural industry. Um, a few invasive weed statistics from the Office of Tech Assessment. Um, there are approximately 4,500 species of foreign plants with established populations in the U.S. and about 15 percent of those plants cause severe harm um, and they, you know, over time caused a lot of documented losses, $97 billion from 1906 to 1991. So in the nursery industry, we are famous for introducing exotic non-native species. We find these great things in other countries. They're beautiful and we want to bring them here. Um, somebody, I'm not sure the source of these, of these statistics because I borrowed them from another weed specialist, but um, it's estimated that the nursery industry has introduced 60,000 exotic species um, into the trade and about 1% of these become invasive over time. In the U.S., it's estimated that 50% of our invasive plants were brought here for horticultural purposes in the, in the first place. And a lot of the woody invasives that we're now um, fighting, about 80% of those were introduced by the nursery industry. Um, some good examples in North Carolina of woody invasives are Chinese privet, autumn olive, and oriental bittersweet. All right, so what is the link between ornamentals and invasives? Um, I put a picture here of my very favorite ornamental plant in my yard, um, probably planted about 50 years ago by the lady that built the house I live in, um, these hostas. I love these hostas because they take so little care. You know, they survive our heat. 
They survive our winters. They are beautiful. They bloom. They spread easily. So they're my favorite horticultural plant around my house. Um, but some people have reported that hostas are starting to become invasive. And if you think about the things that make, that make ornamentals attractive, they're also some of the things that make plants invasive. So that can include, it's easy to propagate them. They grow fast. It's easy to establish them. Um, they bloom early on in the season. They, um, they bloom prolifically. May, they might even make a lot of seeds. And they're, they're um, adapted to our environment and probably don't have a lot of pests. So be thinking about these uh, facets of plants when you go to your garden center to pick out some plants for your yard. Think about, could this plant become invasive in the future? All right, so I work for NCDA. Um, the mission for North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services is to improve, support, and protect agriculture in North Carolina via services and regulation. So there are lots of divisions, and I work for the plant industry division, and we are a regulatory division. So we're responsible for protecting agriculture and the environment from plant pests, including noxious weeds. Uh, we do a lot of nursery inspections. Every registered um, and licensed nursery in North Carolina gets inspected by us. Um, so we do a lot of regulatory things. And that's why I get to work on bad plants. All right, so I operate under two pest laws in North Carolina. Um, the first one is a, the first one is the plant pest law. Um, it gives the North Carolina Board of Agriculture the authority to adopt regulations so that we can eradicate, repress, and prevent the spread of plant pests in the state. And that gives the Commissioner of Agriculture and his agents, so all of the employees were agents, and we are carrying out regulatory as well as inspection um, jobs. So we can, um, we can regulate anybody who wants to plant or cultivate or harvest or get rid of things. And we can also inspect cargo vehicles and premises. Um, a couple times a year we set up shop on I-95 and we inspect trucks that are going north and south to make sure that they have treated their plants with the correct insecticides for, um, for uh, fire ants. All right, so the second law that I operate under is the Aquatic Weed Control Act of 1991. Um, and that grants the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, so DEQ, as well as NCDA, the ability to control, eradicate, and regulate noxious aquatic weeds. Uh, we do that so that we can preserve human health um, and the waters of the state. We wanna make sure that we're um, protecting beneficial plant and animal life. And again, we get to eradicate, repress, and prevent the spread of plant pests throughout the state. And I like to joke around that between these two laws, basically they give me the opportunity to trespass anywhere I want in the state, as long as I'm doing that looking for noxious weeds, and it's between sunup and sundown. But it does give us, it does give us some protection uh, when we're out and about in the state looking for bad things. Alrighty, um, throughout the presentation today, I'm gonna to give you a lot of um, resources. Uh, and I think Charlotte said that she would email you a list of all the websites after, after the presentation. But I wanted to show you the two resources that you may want to access after this presentation. The first is the Federal Noxious Weed List. And all you have to do is go to Google, look at the Federal Noxious Weed List. Um, this screenshot shows that it was last updated in 2010, uh, but I do know some of the researchers at USDA are currently reevaluating this list, and they're considering adding 20 more plants to this list, but they're also considering taking a few off. So um, this list is revisited and reevaluated. So North Carolina recognizes that every plant on this federal noxious weed list is automatically a class A noxious weed in North Carolina. So all the federal noxious weeds uh, from the USDA list are, federal, are state noxious weeds as well. On the right hand side, you'll see a screenshot that I pulled from our website from the plant industry division. I work in the plant protection section and then I um, help run the weed regulatory services. And you'll see at the bottom of that sheet, there's 
class A noxious weeds, class B noxious weeds, and class C noxious weeds. Sorry about that. All right, so we have class A, class B, and class C noxious weeds in North Carolina, and you can find a list of all of them from, at our website. All right, so some of the things that we do in our division to try to eradicate plants, either, either eradicate them, repress them, or prevent the spread. We um, designate quarantine areas, so those might be areas where we already have that bad thing, but we don't wanna move agricultural products out of those quarantine areas. We have regulations so that we can inspect and certify nursery stock. We also issue certificates and permits to people who want to move regulated articles. So a lot of times when people are moving uh, wheat straw from North Carolina to Florida or another state, they have to contact us so that we can inspect the product and write them a certificate. And then we also participate in cooperative programs that other people have started. And an example of that is the Carolina's Beach Vitex Task Force. Um, that, that was started with money from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but had a lot of volunteers, and it was over North and South Carolina, and they were very successful at getting rid of beach vitex along our coastal counties. That was about 10 years ago. All right, so regulated article. I'm sure those of you in normal life have never talked about regulated articles, but for us, it's... Um, the definition of a regulated article is anything that can carry a noxious weed. So think about soil, compost, potted nursery stock, um, cut sod, equipment that might have soil on it, um, hay and straw. So here you see a picture of a bald and burlap tree with some weeds growing out of the top of it. You'll see another potted tree with some weeds in it. Uh, you'll see some hay. This is one way that we brought Kogon grass into our state. In 2008, when we went through the, um, the drought, we imported hay from other states and across Canada. And I believe that when we did that, we brought in um, musk thistle as well as Kogon grass. So it was good because we were able to bring in hay and keep people's livestock alive. But you know, one of the casualties is that we brought in weeds that we didn't have here previously. And then a big, um, another big aspect is people moving their boats from waterways to waterways. Uh, they can move plants as well as invasive snails and invasive fish. So that's another thing to think about when you're moving your boats um, around the states from different waterways. And then the last thing I want to touch on here in this introductory part of the session is that sometimes these invasive plants are really pretty. And I can understand why people bring them into the nursery trade because they're just absolutely beautiful and they have really nice qualities. So sometimes the plants that I'm talking about, they're not bad in and of themselves. They're just the wrong plants in the wrong place. And I wanna get on my soapbox just a little bit and talk to you about this book um, called Bringing Nature Home, written by Doug Tallamy. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this book, but it, um, it's really kind of the um, cornerstone book talking about native plants. And I've really, over the last couple of years, after dealing with all these non-native invasives, I've really gotten on the native plant bandwagon. So invasive species thrive when they come here because they don't bring the pests along with them that existed in their native um, lands. So when they grow here, um, they don't have those pests and it takes a long time for pests and plants to develop symbiotic relationships. And Doug Tallamy estimates that it takes 10,000 years for a feeding relationship to develop between an insect and a plant. Now we've seen some examples where those relationships develop a lot quicker. But in general, when we bring non-native plants here, we're taking them out of their native uh, hope, their native range, and they don't bring the other pests with them that can help keep them in check. And that might be why they become invasive here. So an, an example of um, a native plant versus a non-native plant. We have a really nice native plant here called marsh marigold. The genus is Caltha palustris, genus and species. Um, and that's a native plant here, early spring ephemeral. <clears throat> well, other people started Caverna, with Ficaria verna, which is lesser celandine. And that was brought here in the early 1900s. And just recently, it's become invasive. And you'll see a picture of that on the right-hand side. 
and this um, lesser celandine or fig buttercup is just taking over riparian areas and this it's one of our newest invaders in the state so think about trying to plant native plants instead of a non-native species all right charlotte we have a polling question here can you put up a poll for everybody to participate in absolutely let's see here we're going to launch a multiple choice poll. Just the moment. Oops. Okay, you should see the poll up on the I do. screen. So the question here is, if everyone can participate, please tell me, I guess I didn't really spell out the question right, but which one of these, which one of these plants on this, um, on this multiple choice is the noxious weed? and um, tell me which letter is the noxious weed. So when we talk about noxious weeds, we're talking about either a state or federal noxious weed. And when we're talking about invasive plants, we're just talking about some of those bad plants, but they're not regulated by law. All right, we got lots of answers coming in. We'll leave it open just a few more seconds, so please. Get your answer in. Which one of these do you think is regulate, legally regulated as a noxious weed? All right, I'll give it three seconds. I'm gonna end the poll. Three, two, one. All right, you should be able to see the results. All right, so 51% of you voted um, D is hydrilla is the noxious weed, and you all are correct. Even though you're so smart, this was really kind of a pretest. Um, hydrilla is the, the, a federal noxious weed, so it's automatically a state noxious weed. It's probably our most widely distributed federal noxious weed in the state. Um, we probably I would say it's in at least half of our counties and growing. We don't even really have a good idea of how many waterways hydrilla is growing in right now, but it's the one weed that DEQ spends the most money on. Um, we spend at least a million dollars of state funds just on hydrilla control and just in, in not even all of the hydrilla, just in some of the most important waterways. So yes, privet, Kudzu, bamboo, and Japanese stiltgrass, those are all invasive for sure. I'm sure a lot of you have these plants in your backyard. And um, Mike Munster wanted me to talk a little bit about Ligustrum, I don't actually know how to, to pronounce it, but Ligustrum quinoi. Um, it's a new privet that he has learned about, and I think someone probably brought a, a couple of these plants into the plant disease and the insect clinic uh, for identification. And so it's just one of our newest invaders. A lot of you know about Japanese privet um, and Chinese privet. They're, they're both really invasive, but here's another privet that has started to become invasive in our um, wooded areas. So um, I will say a little bit about that now, and if Mike wants to talk about it more in his time, please, please do, Mike. Alrighty, so are there any questions before we move on, Charlotte? Has anybody asked any questions? Uh, no, somebody just asked to spell that weed and I will type it out in the um, chat box. It, it is on the screen in the, um, it's the image, Q, yeah. It's Q-U-I-H-O-U-I privet. It's in the olive family, it's a perennial shrub, it's, um, it's very similar to Chinese privet, uh, but it's according to this website, the texasinvasives.org, it has narrow, le narrow leaves, more narrow than Chinese privet, and it's much more branched. So I did put it in the, in the chat box as well. But um, yeah, that picture looks a lot like Chinese privet. Yes. Um, so I, I bet a lot of what, potentially a lot of what I've seen and just assume was Chinese privet could be the species. Could be, yeah. Looking closer. We do have another question that about hydrilla, exactly what does okay. hydrilla look like? But yeah, we can ask that question right now because I'm not going to specifically address hydrilla after this. Okay, it's just asking what it looks like. Um, so hydrilla is a submerged aquatic plant. 
and it is rooted in the bottom of a, of a waterway. We're finding a lot of it in farm ponds, and you can easily Google it to find pictures, but it's going to grow basically from the bottom of the water up to the water surface of the water. It can grow in up to 20 feet of water, so basically from the edge of the waterway out to about 20 feet deep and it will become topped out which means it will reach the surface of the water um, by late summer so here in the next month or so you'll start seeing it to be topped out and, and then you'll see leaves kind of at the at the very surface of the water um, it's a kind of a long narrow almost like a pipe cleaner with leaves coming off of that narrow um, stem and they're going to be whirled in um, five, five and seven whirls, five and seven leaves coming off of each whirl. So it's a little difficult, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. I would just suggest googling it, um, but it is a submerged aquatic plant so you'll have to get your hands wet and kind of dig down in that waterway and pull it out to look at it and see if it looks like hydrilla. So if you looked across a body of water that had hydrilla, you might not necessarily see anything at the surface? Not right now, but in about a month, it'll look, there'll just be little leaves. It'll almost look like a frog could walk across the top of it. And um, it's hard to explain, but you will not see it out, out of the water. It will only grow to the surface of the water. So that's correct, Charlotte. All right. Um, and we have another question. Why are nurseries allowed to sell Chinese privet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's an, it's an excellent question, which I really didn't touch on. And, you know, I did tell you about all the laws that I have to follow and the laws that our nurserymen have to follow, and that is they cannot sell state or federal noxious weeds. Um, however, what I didn't say and what I should have said is that there's a lot of invasive plants that are not regulated by law. So nurseries are allowed to sell any plant that's not a federal or state noxious weed. And, you know, Privet, Dr. Joe Neal at NC State actually estimates, well, I think someone else did, and I asked him, and he just said, yeah, I agree. There's probably more acres of Privet than there are kudzu in North Carolina. Um, privet is everywhere. It's very widely distributed. It's in every one of our counties. And, you know, we're in the red part of that um, early detection rapid response graph. So we're at the point where we would never be able to eradicate Privet at this time. And, you know, the responsible thing would be for nurseries to not sell privet because it is invasive. But have you ever heard a nursery owner say that they're going to turn down money? So really, people don't make big changes to their, um, to their business plans unless they're mandated to do so by law. And there's never going to be a time when privet is going to be a state or federal noxious weed. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, that we should have been evaluating this 30 years ago um, and saying, you know, this thing could really become invasive. Maybe we should stop selling it. Um, a a follow-up question to that is, um, what is the line or where is the line to, to be crossed between noxious and invasive weed? So I guess legally it's, it's, if it's noxious, it cannot be sold. Yes. But uh, from a gardener's ecological um, frame, um, there, it, there's not a really clear, uh, these are the plants that are always invasive right everywhere versus versus right. not it, it's it's like other plants it varies by your region yes and there there's several references out there and i'll send that in the follow-up um resources that go out by email is there any um invasive plant references you would recommend yes, yes. so it's a great question you know whether a plant is invasive or noxious you know we've got those those rules um, of the federal and state noxious weeds. And of course, I'm always trying to get more plants put on that list, but, but my supervisors tell me, no, oh, it's already sold and the too widely distributed. There are, the first part of this question is there is a screening tool that the USDA uses to look at new invaders to decide whether they're going to become invas noxious. Um, we already know they're invasive, but could it cross that line be to become noxious? And it's a very in-depth tool. It takes about a week to evaluate one plant. 
um, and I've taken a four day long class just to learn how to use that tool. And they are constantly screening new plants, especially new invaders to the, to, that are coming from outside of the US into the US. They're screening plants to make sure that they're not going to become noxious. But the second part of the question, you know, that's really high level academic thinking. Um, for the homeowner, there is a really nice reference. It's on the North Carolina Native Plant Society website. It's also cross-referenced on the Invasive Plant Council of North Carolina, so NCIPC, and I've got a, a, uh, I've got a screenshot of our website later on in this um, session. Both of those organizations were, you know, were nonprofit organizations that are just trying to promote the planting of native plants and the non-planting of invasive plants. There's a really nice resource list up there and it will tell you kind of uh, tier one, tier two, tier three plants, ones that we really think are going to become invasive or already are invasive, and we would really hope that people stop planting. So Privet, of course, is up there. Um, so those are two really nice resources, and we can send out the link to those resources. I even have a PDF of that um, file if you'd like to send that out, Charlotte. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on a little bit. We're about 30 minutes till the end of my session, so I'm going to zoom through, and I want to give you some um, specific examples and call out a couple of counties and really probably um, bend your ear a little bit about some specific things that the NCDA is spending time and money on. This is, let's see here. All right. So if I was with a live audience, here's where I would get some live audience participation, and I would say, what has anybody in here heard of giant hogweed in the last year? And then I would, I would get a couple people who would nod their head, and then I'd say, why? Why have you heard about giant hogweed? And usually somebody mumbles out that giant hogweed is poisonous, and that's correct. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, about a year, a year ago, in July of 2018, giant hogweed was discovered for the first time in Virginia. And they must have known some really important people in the newspaper and website world because it got into every website. Um, it even got onto like the National Weather Service website that they had found giant hogweed in Virginia for the first time and this plant can make you blind and everybody needs to be looking for it. So of course, when you hear that there's a plant that can make you blind and that can cause skin lesions, you're gonna start Googling and when they Googled around, they found one little info sheet that was put up on the web by the North Carolina Invasive Plant Council of which I'm on the board, um, my favorite group. And we noted that giant hogweed does exist in North Carolina. It's in one county, Watauga County. So people started freaking out um, and they contacted the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Uh, we got, I, we, I got over a hundred phone calls, emails, text messages, and Facebook messages. And a lot of those were going to the commissioner. And so they were getting sent down to me and I needed to answer them right away. A lot of people started worrying that they had giant hogweed in their backyard and maybe they shouldn't let their kids play outside and maybe they shouldn't go hiking on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And it turned into a giant media frenzy. I've never been a part of a media frenzy, so it was crazy. Um, I even did a live on camera TV interview. But the bottom line is, yes, we have giant hogweed in North Carolina. Yes, it's in the mountains in Watauga County, but that's it. We only have it in Watauga County. It is not widespread throughout the state. And um, here's a little bit of background about how that plant got to the US. It is native to Eastern Europe, to the mountains of Eastern Europe. It was brought here in about 1917 as um, a garden curiosity because it is so huge. Um, and so it made its rounds through the botanical gardens and has since become naturalized. It's been in New York State, Pennsylvania State, even out on the West Coast in Oregon and Washington have a few cases of giant hogweed naturalizing. So it's been a, a, a pest for a while now. Um, and it is to be respected because if the sap gets into your eyes, it can cause blindness. And if the sap gets onto your skin, some people are very sensitive to that and it will cause burns, third degree burns, um, and you might be sensitive to the sun from here on out for the rest of your life on that area where the sap burned you. So it is to be respected. 
um, that, that picture right there that you're seeing, that is one leaf. That guy is holding one leaf. So when people call me and tell me that they have giant hogweed in their backyard, the first question I ask them is, how big is the leaf? And a lot of times they'll say, oh, I don't know, like nine or 10 inches. And I'll say, okay, well, I'm not sure what you have, but it's probably not giant hogweed because giant hogweed is giant. It's like something out of Jurassic Park. And each one of those leaves is going to be probably three feet in diameter. So it's going to be bigger than a basketball is what I tell people. So it sounds like I'm complaining about all the media that we got, but I'm really not because as a result of those 100 phone calls and reports that we got, three of them turned out to be positive, and we did find three new locations in Watauga County. Um, we can trace them all back to one location. It's um, right in downtown Blowing Rock, and it used to, a, a medical doctor lived in this house and we think he planted it in his backyard. Um, it's since, that was in the 1980s from what we, what we hear. Um, he doesn't own that, that property anymore, but it's since moved into three backyards adjoining that property. And then everyone else that we've talked to, the majority of them say, oh, they got some seeds from somebody in town and they planted them. They didn't really know what they were. So this doctor spread those seeds around um, and so we do have one location that's not in Blowing Rock and Boone. It's all the way on the other side of the county, and that one just showed up early this year. It was reported by a homeowner. We're not sure how that site got there, but for the most part, uh, it's localized to just the Boone and Blowing Rock area. Now there is a native plant called cow parsnip, native to North Carolina. Same genus, different species. Looks almost exactly like giant hogweed and um, it's very common along the parkway. So we get a lot of phone calls about that one too. So here's some pictures. This is my coworker, Chad, at one of those sites, the first new site we got, and he's spraying uh, Roundup on the bottoms of the plants. We've already cut the seed heads off, um, so you can see just how giant they are. They were growing out here in full sun, but they were also growing in the shade. Here's my hand for perspective with one leaf, and there's the seed head and or the flower and it's you know in the same family as wild uh wild carrot um so in the apaca family so it does look a lot like wild carrot it's just this one is so much bigger just so huge it's really an amazing plant and the only difference between cow parsnip and giant hogweed is these purple spots on the stem most of the time cow parsnip does not have these purple spots so most of the time i ask someone when they're making a report to send me a photo and uh, i think a lot of the extension agents have helped intercept a lot of these phone calls for me because we got calls from all over the entire state about giant hogweed and so you know just a little bit of, of of education can go a long way here so i ask when someone says that they have giant hogweed i ask them to send me a picture including one of the stems so i can see if these purple lesions are present if they're present um, then we need to go out and check it out but if they're not present it's probably that native cow parsnip all right I'm gonna move into Kogon grass. And Charlotte, you actually have some personal experience with Kogon grass, don't you? I do, I do. I found a, a small patch in Pender County. Yeah, I think that was our second patch that we found in the state. And that was the way I first met you was calling you to just ask a little bit about that. So you weren't, were you, you weren't even working in that county, you were just passing through and saw it, right? No, I was based, yeah, I was working in Pender at the time, okay. it, um, but it was something I saw on the way to the grocery store, <laughs> and it was a <laughs> patch, it had been there for years, apparently, and it was in a, a kind of a pasture area that got mowed on a regular basis, and the person who mowed it um, had injured his knee and wasn't able to mow that spring, which allowed it to come up and bloom, and that's the only reason I saw it, is because it was blooming that year, where, yeah. you know, had been there for years and just been being mowed. Yeah, and we kind of think that maybe that little area where it showed up, you know, it could have been planted, 
or it's also an area where the DOT parks their mowers after they get done. And so we were wondering if it could have been a contaminant and some of the seeds fell off their mowers while it was parked there. But the same thing happened two years ago. That same guy injured his knee, could not mow the pasture, and we found some, some plants that we didn't kill the first time. Uh, that we sprayed. So we're still working on that that one site. But let's get into the specifics about Kogon grass. This was, you know how all the, the Better Homes and Gardens has plant of the year? Well, this was my plant of the year for 2017. It seemed like I couldn't catch a break that year. We kept finding Kogon grass. And part of the problem was I kept educating people on what to look for and they kept finding it. So this is why I'm educating you, all you master gardeners, you too can be looking for this plant when you leave your home or your office today. And I'm gonna teach you what to look for. So, um, the bottom line is Kogon grass is really a threat to the forestry industry, um, but it, it's also brought into the state from the horticultural industry, which is why I'm telling you about it. Um, Kogon grass is really expensive to control. The herbicides that we use, um, are called a Mazapir, and they cost about $200 an acre. So once it gets established, it's really expensive to get rid of it. Uh, the rhizomes are lelopathic, and if I was in front of a live audience, I'd ask you what that fancy word means. Um, and usually one or two people know that a lelopathy is when the roots of that plant exude a chemical, a substance that basically poisons the soil so that no other plants can live there. So this thing creates its own herbicide to kill all the other plants so that it has a perfect area for just this plant to grow. And then the reason we don't like it is because it does grow so dense that it reduces the native species that would grow normally under the, in that forest. Uh, it does not provide any habitat for wildlife and really reduces the productivity of forests. And the way it does that is Kogon grass burns really hot. So if you are a forest manager using controlled burns to manage the vegetation under your trees um, and you're burning, burning, burning across your, your, your forest and then all of a sudden it hits a patch of this Kogon grass, it burns at about 840 degrees Fahrenheit. So you get a flare of fire that can go all the way up into the top of those trees. And if you're trying to establish new seedlings, they will become damaged in that fire and probably not survive the fire. So it can cause hot controlled burns and it can make wildfires worse. Here's a map that was produced at um, the University of Georgia in 2010. And you'll notice that in 2010, North Carolina was not even on this map. We were in the free zone. But what you do notice is there's two epicenters of where this plant came into the U.S. One in the Louisiana area, one in the Florida area. That one was introduced on purpose, one was accidental, uh, both in about 1917, 1920. And ever since then, they have marched northward slowly, slowly, slowly. Now I will say that you see that South Carolina and Georgia uh, really only have a few counties infested, and they are both very dedicated to eradicating this pest. And they spend a lot of resources every year trying to get rid of this pest, and they are really partners in the fight against Kogon grass. Some of those area, other areas, it's a lost cause, and they're never gonna be able to eradicate it. So fast forward to 2017, 18, 19. This is what North Carolina looks like now as far as Kogon grass. And you'll see that in several counties we have numerous locations. Pender County is my worst county. Um, it may be that Pender County is my worst county because there's the most Kogon grass there. Or it may be that one of my employees spent the whole summer searching for witch weed in Pender County and also knew what Kogon grass looked like. And he found Kogon grass like five times that summer. So he's really my ace in the hole. He's an excellent scout and he looks for witch weed full time. So it's no doubt that he was able to find Kogon grass. Now I will make note that the sites in Wake County and Moore County, I'm not sure if I have Moore County on this, this this map, but I have a site in Moore County. Those are both Red Baron, 
and you'll ask what is Red Baron and I will tell you in just well, let me tell, let me show you okay so this grass has beautiful seed heads you saw that in one of the pictures some horticulturalist somewhere decided that those seed heads were just beautiful and that they were going to create a sterile variety of this plant now the parent plant kogon grass is a federal noxious weed but somehow they got away with making a varietal a sterile variety called it's called red baron or japanese bloodgrass um, the varietal is rubra so it's Imperata cylindrica is the genus and species, and then the varietal is rubra. And you'll see it's number one on this um, page of a magazine that someone sent me a scan of. This came out in the Better Homes and Gardens magazine in November of 2008, saying this was one of the most beautiful grasses that should be planted. And people took note, people planted it widely, and it's been planted all over North Carolina since the mid 2000s. The problem with Red Baron or Japanese bloodgrass, is that after about 10 years, it genetically reverts back to that parent, and it does no longer has those beautiful red leaves, it starts to have more and more green leaves. So um, we've had two sites, one in, uh, one in Wake County, probably two in Wake County, and one in Moore County at the Sand Hills um, Community College, where rubra was planted and started to take over and they couldn't get rid of it so we went in and sprayed it for them but all the other sites are probably just the regular old Imperata cylindrica and we're we're thinking that they came up here from down south somehow so what are you going to look for when you leave your office or your home today well you're going to look for densely growing patches because remember we talked about how it's allelopathic so no other plants can really grow in that dense patch of grass all the blades are going to be the same height. There's no cent central leader on these plants. So you're not going to have one stem with a bunch of um, leaves coming off of it. Uh, you're going to, basically all the leaves come from the soil um, and, and they're all going to be the same height is basically the easiest way to tell you without sending around a plant, which is what I would do if we were in an auditorium together. Uh, they're going to grow in circular infestations because they mostly spread by rhizomes and the plants stay green even through the winter. And that's how one of our sites was discovered. It was um, discovered by some Forest Service guys driving down uh, this road in the middle of nowhere in December and they saw a patch of green under some pine trees and said, you know, that's, that's not supposed to be there. And then in May and June, you'll see those really pretty seed heads uh, in North Carolina. But believe it or not, most of our sites have been discovered not because of the seed heads, but just because of those dense green grasses. But the one thing that I will do when I come out to visit you, if you think you have found Kogon grass, is we're gonna look for these sharp white rhizomes. And so what I tell everybody is, if you think you found Kogon grass, park your car, get out, and go try to pull some of those leaves out of the ground. And I usually pick out a really strong young dude in a group if I'm doing a training session by a roadside. And I say, come over here. See if you can get some roots out of the ground for me. Lean over, pull some roots out. And they will not be able to pull out any of those roots. They'll get some green stems but they won't, and leaves, but they will not be able to get any roots. So then we'll go get our shovel and we'll dig up um, some roots. And we're gonna look for these sharp white rhizomes. And they, are really sharp. Um, they're so sharp that one day I dug up a big plant and I grabbed it but I wasn't wearing my gloves and it actually poked me in in the finger and I was bleeding. So they're super sharp. I cannot stress that enough. So we have another pole Charlotte and this is about kogon grass and we have a, a B C D or E. So the question here is, what are you going to be looking for when you leave your home or your office today if you're looking for Kogon grass? Got 
just over half of our folks voting now. We'll give it a few more seconds to get, get your vote in. All right, I'm going to close it. Three, two, one. All right, so the good news is nobody is wrong here. Don't you wish all your college <gasps> exams were that easy? <laughs> so you are going to be looking for green circular dense patches of green grass. You are going to be looking for white fluffy seed heads in May and June. You're going to look for white pointy rhizomes if we dig some roots out of the ground. And what I didn't mention, but a lot of other scientists love to use this as an identification feature. It does have a white offset midrib, which basically that's just the seam that runs down the middle of each leaf. Um, I don't really think it's a great um, identification characteristic, but a lot of other people will tell you that it is. Um, so those are all the things you're going to be looking for when you leave um, and drive down the roadside. And all of our sites have been found from the road. Um, we do have some sites that are not on the road, but most of them have just been found by people driving down the road. And if people do find something suspicious, who do they tell? They can always tell me. <laughs> always tell me. And my information is at the end of this slide set, which I am not going to get through in the next 10 minutes, but that's okay. All right, so here's some pictures of my um, handsome co-workers. This is down in Martin County. This is a roadside site. This is that site um, in the forest in Scotland County. This is a site in Pender County, Charlotte, um, a site you probably have not seen, but we know for a fact the landowners here brought this back from Florida. They saw it blooming down there and brought it back. But what I did not know until I'd been there about three times is that there's a cinder block wall growing down the center of that, that patch. And those rhizomes were so strong, they grew right through the cinder block. All right, I wanna quickly tell you about giant salvinia. It's a floating fern from South America. I mentioned that it was a contaminant in the water garden industry. And back between 2000 and 2010, we had a whole bunch of sites in New Hanover, Onslow, and Pender counties that were infested with giant salvinia. And a lot of them were just little koi ponds, but it did get into some big naturalized areas. Um, we had an extension agent down there who took this on. This was like his most hated plant and we could not have eradicated it without his help. Uh, his name is Wayne Batten and he's now retired, but he still loves to hate this plant. So we eradicated it in 2010, thankfully. But why I'm telling you about this plant is that it was recently discovered in the Santee Cooper, which is Lake Marion in South Carolina. That's only a hundred miles from our border and people can take their boats in there and go fishing. They found about a hundred acres of infested area in Lake Marion. So it's a good chance that we're gonna find giant salvinia in North Carolina again. And I want you to be on the lookout when you're driving by farm ponds um, or any lake really for that matter. It's a floating fern. All the green that you can see out there is giant salvinia. It can double or triple its size every couple of days. And when you get out your hand lens, if we were in person, I would be sending around a live sample. You could see these little egg beater shaped hairs on the inside of each leaf. And that's the river bend area in Berga that was totally covered up in giant salvinia. And we had to use an aquatic herbicide to get rid of it in there, which was really expensive treatment. Salvinia can float. And especially if we get um, big water events, it will float and lodge in trees and really move around that way. And it can even survive um, some freezes. I wanna quickly tell you about floating heart since it's in the title of my talk. This was my plant of the year in 2018. Um, it's a, also, again, a real big problem in South Carolina and Santee Cooper. Uh, it's a big problem for them. We found crested floating heart in one location in 2014 in Winston-Salem. We are pretty sure that the homeowner brought it back with him from South Carolina, just found it in a pond, dipped his Rubbermaid container into the pond and brought it back. So this is a good, time for me to remind people please don't bring plants back to your area if you don't know what they are um here this question this this picture is just reminding me to tell you that a um, grad student at nc state with rob richardson did some research she cut each leaf into four parts threw them back into the water and each leaf 
will send out new roots and put on flowers. So just think about what happens when a boat goes through a patch of floating heart. It just creates a whole bunch of new babies. So this is a picture that my friend Chip took in Santee Cooper. All of that is floating heart. This plant made its rounds in the horticultural industry. It's a state noxious weed that NCDA outlawed in about 2013, but you'll still find it in some, um, some uh, garden centers and you can still buy it on the internet and sometimes they'll ship it to North Carolina. I've got only the one side of Crested Floating Heart. We don't have any sites of water snowflake, but we have a whole bunch of sites of yellow floating heart, especially in Moore and Lee County. Um, the extension agents down there are actually helping us with this. I've got a site of this in New Bern, and um, next week I'm going up to Burke County to Lake James, where we also have a site. So yellow floating heart, I know, can grow in every one of your counties. And when you're driving by farm ponds or lakes, I want you to be looking at those, those lakes while you're driving very carefully, of course. Just like me, I'm always rubbernecking to see if I can see some floating hearts out there that are blooming. Um, and it will, it will grow in very shallow water and even in the mud. Um, Purple loosestrife is an invasive aquatic plant too. I've got this around the Winston-Salem area, but we've also had it growing all the way down east in like Martin County. Um, and we've also had it growing in Watauga County. So this is another one. It made its rounds through the horticultural industry. It's a beautiful plant. Um, it's very invasive. It's a federal noxious weed. It's very invasive up in the northeast. And um, it was probably planted intentionally here back before it was a noxious weed and it's just kind of spread. It's really hard to control. I'm going to morrow to Hendersonville. Um, we've got it growing at the airport in Henderson County and the extension agent there has been so, so helpful in helping us scout for this. And he even found a new site um, growing in front of a veterinarian's office last year for us. So um, super helpful to have people looking out for this in wet, boggy areas. So I mentioned fig buttercup really um, quickly at the beginning of this presentation about how it's a spring ephemeral. This is not a noxious weed. It's not on any list and I won't ever be able to list it on any list because it's, uh, it's been here for too long. But it's one that I want you to keep an eye out for. And the reason is it's pretty much all over the state. Um, it's well established in the Northeast, but it's coming south and South Carolina has really taken a hard stance against it. Um, in years past, Plant the Lights Nursery did sell a couple of um, varietals of Ficaria verna. The, my most favorite name is the first one on this list, which is Brazen Hussey. Uh, I think that's a pretty cute name. Uh, but when I went to his website this year, he's no longer selling this, so hopefully he's gotten the message that these can become very invasive. And I put this slide up here to show you the nationwide distribution of EDMAPs um, of Ficaria verna. But I wanna remind you just in the last couple of seconds that I have here, EDMAPs is a free website that each one of you can help populate. It's run by the University of Georgia. It's open source. Um, they have other invasive species on there besides plants, but of course I check out the plants. If you find one of the invasive plants that I've talked about today, but it doesn't have to be a noxious weed. It can just be um, uh, poison ivy. People are putting in mimosas, poison ivy, kudzu. If you find a patch of something, all you have to do is take a picture of it with your phone, and then they have an app called Seedn, S-E-D-N, that you can download to your phone or your iPad, and then you just log into that app and you can upload that you found this site it's maybe a half acre in size this is your name and you don't think that anybody's controlling it those are very helpful for me because those are the public making entries about noxious weeds and i go and check out some of these sites so this is a wonderful um, citizen science opportunity for you and your master gardener groups All right, so again, here's the website for plant industry. Uh, and this is where you will find all those rules, those laws that I talked about, as well as our list of all the plants that are on the state and federal noxious weed list. Um, I wanted to, to show you real quickly the USDA plants database. Uh, this is a wonderful website run by the USDA. 
you can type in any kind of plant here. For this instance, I typed in um, Oriental Bittersweet. Very common in our mountains, but it's moving westward. We have several big patches of it around Raleigh. And so this information, this website will give you a lot of information about any plant you want to look up. But what I wanted to point out here is that there's tabs along the top of the screen and one of those tabs is called legal status. If you click on that tab, it'll tell you which states this plant is legal and illegal in. Um, in this case, it's banned in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, North Carolina. It's a Class C noxious weed in Vermont. Um, so it just gives you a little more idea of if you wanted to figure out what state a plant is um, banned in, you can always look at the USDA plants database and they keep it pretty up to date. Will, will this also tell you if certain plants aren't allowed to be sold because of disease issues or is it just related to being a noxious weed? It's just related to noxious weed. Okay. Yeah. All right, so it'll oh, be and, helpful. I was just, I was, sometimes we get questions from people who say, I want to buy gooseberries, but it says they can't be sold in North Carolina, and that's because of a pine right. disease. But sometimes right. it's because they're noxious weeds, so this would be a good, yeah. good place to check. Yeah, so this is mostly just a noxious weed resource. And then I mentioned really quickly my most favorite group in the world, the North Carolina Invasive Plant Council. We're a nonprofit. Um, we have a website. We have some info sheets on our website. We give out a scholarship every year. We try to hire um, an intern every year. And our main goal every year is we have a two to three day workshop and we rotate areas around the state. And we have some extension agents and we have some homeowners that are a part of our group. And it's always a really good time to just get together with other people. It's sort of like going to church. You know, you hear that these other people are fighting the same kind of invasive species battles that you are. Um, so this is my most favorite group. I've been on the board for many, many years, and we would love to have you as part of our group. Um, and then here is how you can contact me. Again, my name is Bridget Lassiter. I'm the weed specialist at NCDA, and you can always email me or give me a phone call um, and let me know if you have found anything interesting on your travels out and about, things that you have never seen before please get someone to identify what that plant is. If I don't know what it is, I'll, I'll find out what it is and get back to you. Um, and I just thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Charlotte, for giving me the chance to be in front of your group of people, even if I'm still in my office. Absolutely. We really appreciate you being here today and all the resources you've shared. I've been making notes of them. I've tried to drop everything in the chat as well, um, but I will send them also uh, as an email to follow up. So all of the links and sites that have been mentioned. And um, I'll send out Bridget's email address as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and so when they, I was just trying to make a note when, so if people do see something suspicious, you want the GPS coordinates, the type of site location, whether it's a garden or a woodland or a pond and pictures, you said digital pictures. Yeah. Pictures are super helpful because especially when you're dealing with the public, um, sometimes they won't, they won't describe a plant like I do, but I can pretty much tell immediately what it is or whether I know what it is by a picture. So pictures are super helpful and almost everybody has a smartphone nowadays. So they're really easy to snap a picture and text it to me or, or email it to me. All right, excellent. And so we did have a quick question. Is there a recommended plant ID app? Do you know of anything that maybe particularly might help people identify these invasive plants or um, there's plants a in good, um, There's two good apps um, for iPads on aquatic plants. One of, is, one of them is put out by Texas A&M, and I think it's a small fee. And then there's a free one that um, I helped take all the pictures for and write the book for, and that's put out by NC State. Um, so, and that's free for download to iPads. And, People tell me that that's really helpful as far as aquatic plants. As far as other invasive species identification, I don't have a good app, but I am open to any suggestions if someone else knows of one. I get asked that question quite frequently, and I don't know of one either, but I, I, I have not personally used it, but many people tell me they use iNaturalist, which is not so much an app, but you can load pictures and other naturalists will help identify the plants for you. Yes. And actually, EdMaps will import um, entries into iNaturalist. 
Right. Oh, someone just said I use Plant Snap, which I, I have tried that one where you just take a picture and then upload it to Plant Snap, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. All right. Well, thank you again so much. I know I think you're going to hang out with us till the end of the webinar today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt and Mike to share their um, be on the lookouts and then we can follow up with if any additional questions come in at the end. All right. Thank you. So Matt or Mike, you're up. Thanks, Charlotte. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to go first today. Um, we'll let Mike go after me. All right, so let's see. Okay, everybody see? Oh, yes, beautiful picture. Oh, yeah. All right, well, I uh, just got to go over a couple of young lookouts, but first I wanted to mention a really cool caterpillar I found uh, at my parents' house up in uh, Haywood County. Uh, I actually brought it home to Wake County. It is native. This is the Cecropia moth uh, in the family Saturniidae. These are giant silkworm moths, uh, and this one is actually fairly uncommon. This is my first time seeing this. And uh, this caterpillar is a really beautiful one. It's a very large caterpillar, one of our largest caterpillars. This one was about four inches long uh, and as thick as a thumb and uh, really beautiful. And uh, this one was actually found on cherry laurel. So luckily I have some in my yard. I brought it home and it's happily munching on my cherry laurel. And hopefully we can get it to pupate and uh, see the adults next spring or the adult next spring. So they're characterized by these really cool knobs all over the body that are come in three colors. In the front, you've got this uh, reddish orange, you've got the yellow ones down the back, and you've got bluish ones on the side. Um, here was it feeding nicely on, uh, on my cherry laurel, so I was really happy about that. And uh, you will note that they do make giant Frass, so very, very large pellets come from these moth, moth larvae. Um, anyway, I just wanted to highlight this. Um, I'm going to, let's see, I think I might be able to uh, find chat. I, I think I have, yeah, there we go. Here's a link to the, the bug guide page for this moth. Uh, you can actually see what the adults look like. The adults, I think, have the largest wingspan of any giant silkworm moth in the U.S. Uh, very beautiful moths, and uh, I really, uh, really would love to see it. I saw them when I was a kid, but they've become increasingly rarer. Even though they're not endangered, they're just uh, fairly uncommon nowadays. All right, so some other moths you might be seeing soon. Uh, we're gonna get these, uh, many of the caterpillars are gonna become large, they're gonna be more noticeable. Some are more active in the late summer, early fall. So some of the Daytana, these uh, striped and, and fuzzy uh, caterpillars all over different plants. Uh, the oakworms are gonna be coming out soon, especially the orange striped oakworms. They're gonna have, they're in the same family as that previous, the Cecropia moth. Uh, so they'll make similar shaped pellets, but they're going to be uh, much smaller, the frass, uh, about the size of peas. And they often are, they're always on oaks, especially red oaks and uh, red oak relatives. And they'll often drop the frass onto decks and driveways and places like that. Uh, the fall webworms are out and about and starting to be full force. Uh, you'll, they'll start to make their tents on the uh, ends of, branches of various plants. You often see them on the sides of the highways. Uh, and to identify the larvae, they come in a white and a dark form, uh, but they have these very, very long CD that are much longer than four, at least four of the segments combined. So they, very few caterpillars around will have CD that are this long. And of course, you're gonna have various vegetable and garden caterpillars. This is a uh, European corn borer, uh, which can be found in in fruits of uh, you know tomato and peppers and things like that, 
uh, and uh, feeding in various plants. Other things other than those caterpillars, there's gonna be a lot of garden pests now. Hornworms are getting larger. Uh, parsley worms, the, youngs of, the young of uh, tiger swallowtails or black swallowtails. Um, the squash borers, cabbage worms, all of these things are gonna be much more common in the vegetable gardens and the gardens right now. Uh, wasp nests are getting much bigger. So the paper wasp nests and the, the yellow jackets in the ground, uh, once they become full size, they're gonna be a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more active. So be on the lookout and be careful around them. Of course, also the hunting wasps are out and about hunting for food for their young. Uh, lots of pollinators are going to be around. Uh, there's lots of flowers now in the fall or in a, in a month or so. We're going to start to see a lot more goldenrod, which attracts a lot more insects uh, and other flowers. Uh, cicadas, of course, you've heard them now probably. Uh, they are out and about, uh, as are the cicada killers, wasps, these very large wasps that hunt them. Uh, many of the single generation species are becoming full grown. Uh, so there are several groups of arthropods that have one generation a year. So they overwinter as eggs. And so they're very, when they're young in the spring and the early summer, they're very small and, and inconspicuous. But as the season gets on, you get these things like very large garden spiders, uh, large praying mantises, and crazy. Um, and so, so these things are going to be more noticeable now. And of course, it's just a very active time of year. It's very warm uh, and there's a lot of growth of plants, things like that. So be on the lookout and let us know if there's uh, anything that you uh, wanna know about them. And if there's any concerns, let us know. All right, I guess I'm up if there were no questions for Matt. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Very clear. Well, um, this, I mean, it was certainly fascinating, Bridget, your, your presentation, but I feel like that's two downers in a row there. First hearing all about the invasive spotted lanternfly and now about all the weeds. I just want to mention though, it was actually Dave Steffen who had been a plants, pests, and pathogen presenter up until 2012, entomologist here before Matt, who was the one who brought up the ligustrum, the other species of ligustrum that wanted it mentioned. So thank you for mentioning that. Let me quickly share my, let's see, oops, sorry, one second. Okay. While you're getting that up, there was a, a post in the, um, chat that says curious about emerald ash borer and impact on oaks but then I see Matt's re reply to it that it does not attack oaks they only attack ash okay. all right so I'm sharing here a few of the be on the lookouts for August in terms of diseases I I held back a little bit I realized that I did a lot of bolos last month and I'm gonna try and not use quite the spaghetti method of just throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks, but try and be a little more selective. Although there are quite a few, we're still in a very active disease season. And for example, our vegetable gardens are starting to get a little long in the tooth and maybe showing some problems. Although not uh, to leave the arthropods behind, I was appreciative sitting at breakfast this morning, my wife and I, uh, with a view of the vegetable garden and there was a little Carolina wren hopping in and around the tomato plants and I thought aha you're getting those caterpillars so we do have some biological control going on as well. As far as diseases in the vegetable garden nutrient deficiencies may be uh, becoming more common if folks aren't keeping up with the nutrient needs of their plants and of course root knot nematodes on so many things you would just notice it as a wilting that starts by going away in the evening and then becomes more persistent as time goes on, but you're not gonna know for sure until you dig it up and look at those root systems to see if you have root knot or maybe some kind of a root rot. Southern stem blight will be evident at the base of the plants with the stem 
rot and causing general wilting of the plant, but also you want to look for that white mycelium. I don't have a picture of it on this screen here, but the white mycelium and then the small red or reddish brown sclerotia that develop. Interestingly enough, we had some samples from a uh, greenhouse, uh, a greenhouse and nursery operation this year that had southern stem blight in places that I really would not have expected to see it. This is a zinnia from a greenhouse, is the most recent one, quite unusual. Basil downy mildew. I asked Matt this morning if he had seen it on his basil. I know he grows it. I think he likes pesto. And he said he had not, and I haven't seen it on the little pot of basil on my front steps. So this might be a little bit quiet this year, although I saw there was a report in the western part of the state in a research plot earlier this month. So be on the lookout for that. You're going to see the leaves maybe going yellow and brown, but you want to turn it over and look for that characteristic dark, in this case, sporulation on the leaf. Some downy mildews will produce a whiter colored sporulation, but this is the one, one of the ones that has a darker color to it. On the beans, you may see some Cercospora leaf spot pictured there and also some anthracnose pictures on the pods on the far right. Those are a couple of things that we talked about last time as well. Continuing in the vegetable garden, I shortened my cucurbit list to, to watch out for. Downy mildew tends to be very angular and, and yellowish on cucumber, uh, more blotchy on squash. And you see that on the far right. Also powdery mildew, especially squash and pumpkin, and you can see it on some gourd here in the picture on the immediate right. Tomato, bacterial wilt, of course, one of our biggest problems. Bacterial leaf spot you may see, as well as septoria leaf spot. It's the septoria leaf spot that's pictured in the, uh, in the photo. I'm sorry, no, the picture there is actually gray leaf spot. That's stemphilium, which is not on the list, but I, I should add that to our, our bolos here, the, the gray leaf spot as well. Uh, and septoria leaf spot, fusarium wilt, especially in your heirloom tomatoes, early blight and late blight. So far, so we have not had any reports of late blight on tomato in North Carolina this year, but it's really very close in Eastern Tennessee. At least there was a report uh, over a week ago now, but this month. So especially in the mountains, you wanna be very alert to the possibility of late blight in tomatoes. Uh, Marjorie is saying also TSWV, and we've certainly been talking about that uh, in previous editions. Um, I guess, yeah, it'd be worthwhile keeping an eye out for that, especially your fruit symptoms at this point, those ring spots like we illustrated last week. Uh, can tomato wilt contaminated soil be composted? Um, I'm not sure I understand quite the question, uh, Dan, about composting of soil. So maybe if you could, could reword that a little bit, maybe I'll, I'll capture your gist. In the flowers and the perennials, powdery mildew will be coming into its apogee here. We of course see it on Coreopsis, on Vernonia, ironweed, zinnia, and many more different kinds of plants. Rusts, such as on aster and possibly other perennials. We're looking not so much like the gymnosporangium rust that we talked about earlier in the year, but the ones that form the, the pustules on the underside of the leaf, kind of a, a rusty red color before they later in the fall may turn black as the sexual stage forms. Petunia, Phytophthora crown and stem rot, as well as Rhizoctonia stem rot. On black-eyed Susan, Rudbeckia, you could see septoria leaf spot, which is pictured there, or else uh, downy mildew, which tends to have slightly larger blotches. And Phytophthora root rot and aerial blight on Vinca is always a problem year after year. Not to be confused with the much less common Rhizoctonia aerial blight, that tends to kind of mat the leaves together in a way that doesn't happen with the Phytophthora. And Zinnia, besides the powdery mildew already mentioned, can get Alternaria and bacterial leaf spot, Xanthomonas, but both of these can go to the petals. So you may start seeing some Zinnia flowers looking like the one in the lower right. All right, Dan, uh, I have containers of soil where tomato wilt occurred. I don't want to spread the soil into an area that doesn't have the contamination. Will composting restore the soil to being usable? I would definitely not do that, uh, Dan, because if you've got something like a Ralstonia solanaceorum, the bacterial wilt, southern bacterial wilts that caused it, then that is very persistent in the soil and you wanna avoid that at all costs. 
Um, I, and I wouldn't guarantee even, especially if you don't get hot enough composting and I don't really know what, how much it needs if it were something like a, a fusarium wilt. So that would not be a good thing to, uh, to try and risk. Hopefully that answered your question. If not, go ahead and, oh, thanks, great. From our turf people, I always steal from the list that Lee Butler provided me and pictures off of turf files. But again, brown patch on fescue and rye grass. This is where you've got cool season grasses undergoing stress during the hot part of the year, the Rhizoctonia species. And there's also large patch on, on warm season grasses to be looking for. Fairy ring any time of year on any turf grass. Gray leaf spot, you see photographs there in the upper right on um, summer patch. Actually, I may, I may be wrong and the summer patch may not be something still to be looking for in August. I'll have to double check that. But rust, as you see illustrated, uh, is something to be watching for on multiple turf species. And fruits and nuts, bitter rot on apple. We've talked about this in the program in the past and you can diagnose that by cutting the, cutting through the apple at the point of the decay and seeing if you get that V-shaped profile to it. That is the characteristic of bitter rot. Sooty, blot and, sooty blotch, excuse me, and fly speck cosmetic basically on the surface of the apple, but quite common. Just to very much narrow down the grape disease is to watch for black rot, which would be on the fruit, on the berries in a bunch grape or as a leaf spot in muscadines. And then Pierce's disease, see the photograph there in the, in the lower right, a problem on uh, either kind of grape. Both brown rot in the fruit phase and scab on peach. And you see photographs of both of those in the lower left. And pecan, something to watch out for would be pecan scab photograph there in the center of the screen. Uh, let's see, from April, how can you control brown spots? Um, which particular brown spot are you referring to there, April? Well, while she's following up on that, let me quickly get the last slide up here. Um, shade trees and shrubs. Poor planting is a chronic issue with either plants that have been improperly uh, grown in the nursery and have roots that are in a circular fashion and not cut up when it's planted. Or you could have J rooting where it's, the tap root is bent as it's put, in, it's put into the ground. Or you can get girdling roots that develop, especially if the tree is planted too deep or mulched too deep. And as the tree expands in diameter, it basically chokes itself off with some of these roots. Boxwood blight, always be on the lookout for that. If you uh, would like more information on that, there's uh, some available on our Extension Plant Pathology website. And of course, uh, we've talked about it before on the program. Phytophthora and armillaria root rots, always something to be suspicious for in most kinds of trees and shrubs, or many kinds of trees and shrubs, I should say, um, when you see the entire plant declining. With oaks, we could still see some slime flux, one of our heat of the summer problems as well as getting some anthracnose and some tobacco leaf spot on the leaves. Bacterial leaf scorch should just be starting to show up. We saw our first sample of it just uh, about a week or two ago in oak, although it was in willow oak it appeared to be, which is a first for us. Uh, sycamore is another big host of bacterial leaf scorch. And you can see the classic symptoms of that on the photograph in the center on the lower part of the slide. Hydrangea will be getting a lot of Cercospora relief spot and some Coronesp relief spot as we get into the fall, pretty much across uh, any place that the big leaf hydrangea is growing. And Rhizosphere and needle cast would be something to watch for in spruce trees. We're starting down, especially in the lower branches, especially in the inner part of the tree, you get the, the browning and the drop of the needles. Now, um, we go back to a brown spot in, was it all right, uh, this patch here, I mean, sorry, this patch, this slide, referring to brown patch. Okay, uh, that must be the, the disease that April is referring to here. And I would refer 
uh, both her and anyone else interested to that Turf Files website underneath the, um, at the very bottom of the slide there, where it'll go into not just the symptoms and the conditions under which these occur, but there are some uh, indications on, on control there. And there are some, at least one fungicide available for homeowner use, I believe, against brown patch. So with three minutes to go, I will take any questions that folks might have. While folks are getting those questions entered into the chat, I just have a couple more last minute um, announcements and just wanted to talk a, a little bit about our um, move these out of the way. Our plant feature plant this feature plants this month, which are the milkweeds, um, which as Matt talked about, there's lots of caterpillars out there feeding right now, and some of them are monarchs. And um, I have definitely seen uh, more monarchs in the last few weeks. We had a, like a, several in the spring, and then we had a little bit of a lull, and now the monarch caterpillars are back again, and of course the adult butterflies. And you're only ever going to find monarchs feeding on Asclepias. These are the milkweeds, and there are quite a few species, over a dozen species native to North Carolina, but when you are going to plant them in a landscape, there's only a few that are widely adaptable to landscape conditions um, and, and easily propagated, so more available in nurseries. And um, the two most common are butterfly weed, which has the orange flowers, which is blooming now or just finishing up its bloom. And then the swamp milkweed with pink flowers, which is just starting to bloom now. So Asclepias tuberosa and Asclepias incarnata. Um, they're both very adaptable, do well in landscape conditions. Um, Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed, favors drier sites, so, so uh, sandier soils, um, slopes, anywhere where it's a little drier, it tolerates full sun, it'll even grow in part shade, whereas swamp milkweed, as you could guess from that common name, um, will definitely tolerate moisture and even um, flooding. So wetter sites, heavy clay soils, um, also for sun to part shade, um, but wetter sites you would want swamp milkweed. And they are both North Carolina natives. They are both deer resistant. Um, their flowers attract many, many pollinators, uh, but it is the monarch caterpillars we want for the foliage. So don't be surprised when the leaves start getting eaten up. This is perfectly fine for the plants. Um, they're very, very adapted to this. And I do notice, and I think there's a direct link, especially with butterfly weeds, very common on the roadsides, and it gets mowed a lot by DOT, and it grows right back. And I guess it's just simulating that being eaten by caterpillars. So if, um, if you're looking to increase monarch habitat in your landscape, try, uh, look out for one of these species, add them to your yard. There's lots of great information out there on supporting monarchs, and I've listed a couple of sites here that I'll send out in the email that goes out, but the Xerces Society has some great resources. The Monarch Joint Venture, which is a national partnership between many, many um, federal and state organizations, and then if you're looking to, to buy the plants directly, there are a couple of native plant lists available that um, for nurseries that specialize in native plants. The North Carolina Botanical Gardens and the North Carolina Native Plant Society both has those lists that could help you find nurseries more likely to have these plants in stock. Charlotte, let me uh, just mention one other thing. This is Mike. Be careful to inspect those plants before you purchase them because we have seen a couple of cases with a very um, severe bacterial blight on, I've seen it a couple of times on butterfly weed and once now on milkweed. So you wanna make sure that you're putting a healthy plant out. I don't know if it would be as severe out in the landscape as it would be in the nursery setting, but it's something to be sure and be careful of. Thank you. So is, would that be brown spots on the leaves? How would that look? Uh, I've seen it as, I think, yeah, dark spots, but also entire shoots blighting. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you for adding that. And also another thing, especially if you want to put these plants out um, in anticipation of butterflies to eat them, I mean caterpillars to eat them, you would want to make sure they haven't been treated with pesticides. So we might want to ask that from, from the nursery. 
All right, this is an email that went out yesterday. Um, the Virginia Extension Master Gardener College, Master Gardener volunteers in Virginia have invited North Carolina Master Gardeners to join them this fall up in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, September 18th through 22nd um, for their EMG College. Um, and um, this is, uh, for them, it's going to be a preview of where they are hosting the International Master Gardener Conference in 2021. So if you would like to see what um, what Virginia Master Gardeners do at their Extension Master Gardener College, meet our, our Master Gardeners in our state to the north. Um, Lord, they have a great program coming up. Uh, please take a look at their registration website, which has all the information about how to sign up, where the hotel is, what the program is. Um, and mark your calendar for the September and then definitely mark your calendar for September 12th through 18th 2021 so a few years down the road but that was that will be the International Master Gardener Conference which again will be hosted by the Virginia Master Gardener program and to learn about all these type of opportunities you can sign up for the um, Extension Master Gardener volunteer email list and also get the follow-up emails for our plants, pests, and pathogens with links to the resources that are discussed. And that is all for today, other than to, uh, from me, and we'll, we'll look at questions, but um, just to say our next couple of plants, pests, and pathogens will be August 27th, where we will have Matt and Mike giving us more detailed uh, discussion of current plant pest and disease issues. And then on September 24th, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Barbara Fair, who will be talking about tree care, especially with storms in mind as we move into hurricane season. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will stay on and answer any questions. Um, but I appreciate, um, again, appreciate Bridget being with us today and um, for all of you who tuned in and um, go out and look for invasive weeds or uh, noxious weeds <laughs> and uh, let Bridget know. All right, I don't see 